All right, I think we're rolling. I'm back in plenary session, joined via Zoom for a real treat. I'm speaking with Martin Kuldorf. Professor Kuldorf is a professor at the Harvard Medical School. He specializes in surveillance for infectious disease and other problems. Uh, Dr. Kuldorf, it's a pleasure. Uh, Dr. Kuldorf, it's a pleasure to speak with you this morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. I mean, there's so many things to talk about with you. I mean, obviously, there are issues of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID policy, which I'm going to be very interested to have you kind of articulate your point of view on. Um, and then there are the meta issues, I think, which is that, you know, when a society is faced with an unprecedented threat and responds in an unprecedented manner, um, you know, I believe it is uh, not only natural, but it is inevitable that there will be some professors who do not agree with the response as other professors. I mean, that's just a, it could be any problem. It, it doesn't have to be a virus. It could be anything on earth that if you respond in an unprecedented way, people will disagree. And then the question I have, the meta question is, well, how do we air those disagreements? How do we have those disagreements? How do we make substantive progress in seeing where we agree and disagree, where there might be legitimate um, uh, room for compromise, room to move in different directions, um, and, and, and what should that look like? And I, and I worry about that, and I worry where we are. Um, so it's a pleasure to sit down with you. Um, let me first ask you if you might uh, give listeners a little bit about your background. Um, I have read somewhere um, that you were born in Sweden, uh, uh, which are, these days is a bias. <laughs> Um, so I wonder if you might tell about, you know, where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? And how did you find yourself? Uh, how did you get to the Harvard Medical School? Uh, so I, I grew up in Sweden. I went to college there. And then I went to came to the United States. I have a PhD from Cornell University. Okay. And then I worked uh, at different places. I worked at Uppsala University for a while at the National Cancer Institute. Okay. Um, and eventually ended up at, uh, at Harvard. I've been there for maybe about almost two decades. And uh, uh, sort of by accident, I would guess. And, and um, you're... I was interested in the methods that I had been developing. I thought it would be useful to collaborate more closely. And you, and you work closely with many um, of the Harvard epidemiologists who on the policy issues you, you may not fully agree. Uh, for instance, you collaborated with Mark Lipsitz um, and, and other folks in that group? Uh, actually, I'm a little bit different from most of the infectious disease epidemiologists mm -hmm. at uh, academic settings because most of my collaborate, collaborations is all are, they are actually with uh, uh, health departments, uh, mm -hmm. with state health departments, uh, some local health departments, so like the New York City Health Department, uh, as well as with the Centers for Disease Control. And I also interact with uh, health departments in other parts of the world. Because those methods that have been uh, been de uh, developed, they are used by many different health departments. So uh, right. they always have questions or issues or suggestions or ideas. So I have done a lot of interaction with uh, people from different health departments. I see. So, so I guess what you're trying to articulate, if, if, if I may say, is that um, your space in this uh, surveillance, uh, epidemiology surveillance of infectious disease is more of the pragmatic, practical uh, side of things. Um, your career has been sort of as a pragmatist. Is that fair to say? Uh, well, I work very with practical problems. At the okay. same time, I develop methods. So I it's the okay. so size of the same coin. I of. see. But, but I guess... Uh, the methods you're developing are methods that you will be implemented in a very in the near term. And these aren't methods for uh, the shelf. They're not methods for publication. They're methods that will actually be implemented by health departments ASAP. Yes, and sometimes they have some problem for which the methods doesn't work, and then I develop, uh, I sort of, uh, uh, I adapt the methods to develop something new so that it will work for them. And that's why it's very valuable to interact with the health department, both for their, for them, because they get the methods they need, but also for me as a scientist, because I see what the problems are and where the needs are. Yes, and of course, you, you see where, what happens when the rubber meets the road. So I'm wondering exactly. if, you might, if you might talk about, like prior to COVID, what were the most recent um, uh, situations for which you developed methods? Were, there, were they infectious agents? W what were they? Uh, so, for example, I work closely with the New York City Health Department uh, and their surveillance system for reportable diseases. So setting up a system where they monitor on a, on a daily basis uh, uh, the cases of reportable diseases to see if there suddenly is an outbreak of, for example, salmonella. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it was in 2015, mm -hmm. in the summer, there was a huge outbreak in the Bronx of Legionnaire's disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a, a dozen people, I think, who died, uh, which seemed a lot then, but of course, uh, maybe today it doesn't seem so many, but uh, uh, every, every life is, is, is extremely valuable. So uh, that outbreak was detected through the system that we developed together uh, with the automated system of uh, detection, det det quickly detecting uh, new infectious disease outbreaks. And uh, uh, so, so, uh, so it worked there and uh, they use it for other infectious diseases and it's used by other, other, uh, other health departments around the world. I see. So, I see. Uh, reportable diseases, Salmonella, Legionnaires disease, and including some STDs are reportable, uh, syphilis, for instance? Uh, yes, some of them are reportable. Nice. But then the methods also used for uh, other diseases, like cancer, for example, using cancer registry data, which is, of course, not infectious, so it's not daily mm -hmm. analysis, but uh, you can still uh, uh, monitor cancers <laughs> and, uh, and see if there are, uh, are, are, do the surveillance for the cancers as well. I see. Well, I guess I um, a couple of years ago, I spent a great deal of time trying to get to the bottom of how uh, SEER uh, and the NCI actually project how many cases, incident cases and deaths from cancer there are per year. And uh, and it was it was much more elaborate than I thought, I'll be honest with you. Yeah, it's an extremely, you know, it's certainly not that we're counting every case. We're sampling in a number of people and we're drawing some extrapolations from that. And there are different methods in place to adjudicate death, for instance, death due to cancer versus death, you know, uh, with cancer from death from cancer. Uh, and it was quite complicated. And uh, we ended up writing a paper on it in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Yeah, many things are much more complex than you think when you start. But that's also <laughs> Oh, Martin, no, no. Science. If that were true, then then certainly not everybody would, uh, could could make an Excel spreadsheet and then tell us what we should do for COVID policy. That's what I see on Twitter. I see a lot of Excel spreadsheets. Okay, yeah. so then, let me fast forward to, you know, our time is going to be gone before I know it, but I guess I want to talk, obviously we have to talk about COVID. So, um, so you know, in, in March of 2020, um, the, the threat of SARS-CoV-2 was looming. Actually, it was actually, the, the history is a little bit different. The history is this. In January and February of 2020, um, some pundits went on CNN and they reassured us that SARS-CoV-2 is nothing to worry about. Of course, the flu is worse than COVID. There's more cases every year uh, of the flu than COVID. You should get a flu shot if you want to do something about COVID. Don't worry about COVID. The same experts, of course, did a quick 180, quick 180 in March. Um, what were your thoughts in March um, when you started to hear about, you know, the growing caseload um, and, 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 and nations almost simultaneously within a two-week period in March, um, all uh, you know, based, I think, initially on what we heard from Wuhan, but then Lombardi, um, they all similarly reacted in the middle of March. What were your thoughts back then? Well, uh, as soon as we saw the outbreaks in Italy, northern Italy, and in Iran, uh, it was obvious to me that this was going to be a pandemic uh, that was impossible to stop. It was going to be a worldwide pandemic because it has sort of reached Italy and Iran under the radar there were already many people who were severely ill. So, uh, so it was obvious that this would, would uh, engulf the, the whole globe eventually. Yes. yes. And th I think that was probably maybe in February. So, so that was certainly before March. Yes. And then I was worried about 10 minutes uh, <laughs> because then I looked at the data, the very early data from Wuhan. And I saw that there was, we, at that time, we didn't know about the infection fatality ratio. So we didn't know how many people would die among those who were infected. Yes. But from the Wuhan data, we could actually get a really good uh, idea about the relative uh, mortality by age. Yes. And already then it was clear that there was more than a thousand fold difference in mortality between the oldest and the youngest because yes. there was no reason to believe that the exposure between the ages would be very different. Okay. Because nobody knew about the virus in Wuhan then, so everybody would go about their normal life. I see. So, so, so what you're uh, saying is that just simply by virtue of the age with which deaths occurred, you would already be inferring that there's a steep age gradient. Because the yes, that was clear age. already back then. Yes. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I'm a father of uh, three children. I'm a single father. Uh, and as a parent, the thing you worry the most about is not yourself, but the children. 
Mm, of course. So I, I knew then that mm. my children would be safe. I see. And that this was not, not, it was not dangerous for them. Uh, it was clearly dangerous for older people. I really yes. didn't know exactly how dangerous it was for the people in the middle. But at that time, it was very clear that it was not dangerous for children. So then I sort of wasn't so worried anymore because I, uh, I'm mostly worried about my kids. I than anybody and, else. And, and I guess, and, and, and the simple fact is to, I mean, if, if, if you'll permit me, what, what you're saying is that if this virus were equally lethal in children, you would have expected to see reports from Wuhan of many, many child fatalities. You did not see that. You saw many, many fatalities in the 80s, the 70s, and some of the 60s. And from that, you inferred this virus has been spreading unchecked. The probability it will infect any person of any age is roughly equal. And the fact that deaths are occurring disproportionately in older ages tells me there is some steep age gradient here in terms of risk of death. Um, uh, and, and thankfully, unlike other uh, respiratory viruses, which may disproportionately kill children, uh, this is not one of them. That's, how you, that's what you all went through your mind very quickly. Exactly. So uh, that was my conclusions. Okay. And then I was surprised that, uh, uh, that this was not utilized, this fact. So people were talking about uh, down the road, back in March, they were talking about closing schools instead of protecting nursing homes. I see. And uh, I was sort of a little bit surprised and shocked because to me that was sort of obvious. <laughs> and then I tried to share my thoughts uh, on these things and uh, uh, I failed to do so in the United States. Uh, even though I have spent a couple of decades working on infectious disease outbreaks, I work, I think, at a reasonably respectable university. <laughs> yeah, I think and, so. Uh, I was unable to publish these uh, thoughts about the age graded and, and uh, what was the right approach. Uh, uh, oh, that's not 100% true because that's true in the US. And I, I, I failed in the UK also a little bit, but in Sweden, I had no problem. So in Sweden, uh, I published uh, three uh, uh, op-eds in, uh, in the two major daily newspapers there. So in Sweden, it was not a problem to make my voice heard, but in the US, it was impossible. And that uh, surprised me greatly. Well, I see. Well, uh, uh, well, I'll come to that. I have a little theory as to why that might be the case. But I guess what you're telling me is, um, I, I think, I think um, it, it is difficult for people who observe you to, uh, uh, to say something like you would lack the credentials to comment. Uh, I, I personally don't care for that line of argument. I think it's always better to argue the merits of the argument. But in this case, uh, I think you're making a meritorious argument. Uh, and, and you certainly have been in this space for a long time, and yet you're facing extreme difficulties in publishing. That's noteworthy. Um, the next thing I went, wanted to ask you was, um, you know, I, I've gone back and I've read a lot of the documents from George W. Bush era about how society ought to deal with inevitable pandemic. Uh, pandemic was, uh, it, it's, it, it, to some degree, it's expected that there would someday be a pandemic. Um, Correct. Right. There's no surprise there. Everyone, everyone knew that was coming. Okay. When I go back and I read the documents, people, peer-reviewed publications, and even some of these sort of um, white papers that existed back then, there were certain restrictions they thought would be untenable. And among those restrictions, I think the lockdown of a free society, they believed would not be, you wouldn't be able to do it. I mean, they believed that the U.S. is different than Wuhan. In Wuhan, you can see a picture of somebody welding a door shut. You know, you can say, you can have a center in Wuhan that says anyone who tests positive for SARS-CoV-2, you got to live here for 14 days, quarantine yourself in this centralized location. Those sorts of interventions, we can't even do. I mean, not, not that we lack political will, it's just that the nature of this society is a society that will not accept those interventions. Um, and yet, in March, middle of March, we had discussed, and in fact, you know, I, I mean, to some degree, there were different mandates, shall, you know, it varies very widely, shelter in place, essential business closure, um, but all under the heading of, of, uh, of Tony Fauci's hunker down kind of slogan. Um, what did you think when this was the response? Uh, did, were you surprised that we were, we were pursuing it, um, I guess is my question. Yeah, so I think the approach to the pandemic goes against the, the, the long established principles of uh, public health. Uh, in many respects. So I was actually stunned that uh, uh, about these lockdowns uh, because uh, um, it was clear to me, and I think it's obvious by now that uh, lockdowns, when you have a pandemic, lockdowns cannot uh, work. It can uh, temporarily flatten the curve, 
And that makes sense you don't want to overburden the hospitals in a short time, but it can never, uh, uh, it can never sort of suppress uh, the thing. And I think what happened uh, after the spring, because it went down in the summer, so I think many of the uh, lockdown proponents thought that it was the lockdowns who had done that, yeah. and that we were in the clear. But then, uh, but to me, as an infectious disease analyst, it was obvious that this was going to come back. Not, not the, the, the how much uh, exactly, but it was clear that it's going to come back. So that's why in October I met with uh, Professor Sunetta Gupta from Oxford, one of the preeminent infectious disease immunologists in the world, and Professor Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford uh, to, uh, to write up the Great Barrington Declaration, which is the one page uh, proposal for using focused protection, which is, which is very much in line with all those prior uh, pandemic preparedness plans that. Uh, uh, that has had, had been uh, prepared. And so there's nothing novel or new in what we proposed in that one pager, uh, but it was important uh, that we didn't redo the same mistakes uh, when, uh, when the second wave come back. And at the time we were sort of derided that, that, that lockdowns were a strong and that nobody wanted to do lockdowns and there was no need for it. Mm -hmm. But it only took a few weeks when people were starting to talk about lockdowns again. So it was obvious, I think, to, to, to me and my colleagues that uh, there would be another wave coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, then people think, people thought that the lockdowns and the masks and the contract tracing would a be able to suppress it and control this pandemic. I think that mm -hmm. was a very naive belief. But in believing that, they thought that that would also protect the high risk older people, which it didn't do. And that's what we have seen. We have seen enormous mortality among the old. Uh, so uh, let, me, let me ask you this question because, yeah. because they because they thought that it would work uh, there was not implemented basic uh, well-established uh, ways to to uh, to protect the older high-risk people in a, in a focused manner nice, at nice. nursing homes etc there's I guess I, I think um, you know uh, books will be written about some of the errors made around nursing homes obviously including you know failing to invest in uh, paid sick leave for people who work there, failing to have appropriate PPE provided, failing to, um, uh, you know, uh, prevent the same person from going to multiple nursing homes, failure to, uh, if somebody is sick with SARS-CoV-2, sending them back into the nursing home like a cruise missile. I mean, this is just, uh, uh, defies, defies any sense. But exactly. I would, yeah, so we'll, we'll agree wholeheartedly there. And I think that this is one of the things that people miss is that in, and I'm eventually going to get to this part, but I mean, I think to some degree that, you know, you have been demonized and criticized and all, said all these things, and I'm going to ask you about some of them. But I think one of the things people miss is that the person you may be demonizing because you disagree with them about some portions of the argument may also be offering very legitimate, constructive suggestions for other portions. For instance, all along, I think even your most ardent critics will concede to you that many of your suggestions around protecting nursing homes are uh, indisputably correct. I mean, I think that's just even even if they criticize you on other aspects of your of your ideas. But let me come to this on the lockdown. I wonder if you might concede, or at least if you if you believe it, or maybe 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 it's not the case. But um, like a lockdown is not like taking a baby aspirin. It's not the same intervention every time you take it. It's not the same for you as it is for me. Um, what an aspirin will do in my body. The lockdown depends on so many factors. One, when you talk about a Wuhan lockdown, that's a lot. I mean, they're welding doors shut. Okay, that's a that's a that's a that's like taking a 55 aspirin. I mean, I don't know, that's a strong dose of something. When you talk about a US lockdown, it's something in between. Um, and the lockdown also depends, I think, on the seating conditions. In the US, if we start with a baseline of 50,000 people are infected and you lock down and you know some tiny fraction of people are going to be cheating and going and meeting anyway, um, versus in Australia, hypothetically, I don't know the answer, but what if the seating condition was 300 people were infected, 1,000 people were infected, or some difference in the seed? Um, the seeding load may have something to do with whether or not the intervention is effective. Would you? Is that even theoretically possible? Um, how do you think about that? Uh, it is. So once it has come to a country, uh, it's sort of hopeless to suppress the disease. Um, uh, so you can only sort of uh, drag it out for longer. But you say that, but what about Australia, New Zealand? Like perhaps if there's so few cases, maybe they can drive it to zero. Uh, yes. Yeah, so they started their lockdowns uh, 
when they had a few cases, but mm -hmm. the key thing that mm -hmm. they did that made a difference, okay. uh, that was very smart of them, and that was to place themselves in the Southern Hemisphere okay. when, this, uh, <laughs> when this outbreak started, because we now know that there's a big seasonal gradient. So the, the herd immunity threshold is very different in the winter and the summer. It's much lower in the summer. Uh, so the Northern Hemisphere had a hopeless situation because uh, uh, the first cases came in, 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 uh, in December and then it sort of grew and grew. Uh, uh, but this was during the winter season when, uh, when, the, when it spreads a lot. But for New Zealand and Australia, it was in the summer season. Mm -hmm. so it was much easier for them. They had fewer cases to start with and then they had the summer season with a much lower herd immunity threshold. So they were actually able to suppress it. And then once they had done that, they closed the, the border and required, I think, two weeks of yes, quarantine okay. for anybody coming in. And, and they're good about it, unlike other, I mean, they're good, quite good about it, my understanding is, about that quarantine. Yeah, and they're, they, since they are both islands, I guess Australia is the continent, but in, in, they sort of have an island situation so that it's yeah, harder to sort of sneak in uh, in some ways. But it, despite that, there were still more cases who did uh, come in, so they had to do local lockdowns uh, throughout. Uh, so, I think, uh, so I think that's the difference between the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern mm -hmm. Hemisphere. But I guess, I guess, what do you, I guess my, I guess it's a philosophical, not a, I guess it's an empirical question that someday maybe we'll know the answer, but I mean, do you believe that under any circumstances it's possible the lockdown works or do you believe under no circumstances it could work? Well, I guess it would depend on the disease, okay. uh, but for a pandemic that spreads like COVID, um, it was hopeless in the Northern hemisphere for sure. Okay, well, I mean, yes, okay, I, I don't dispute that claim, but I guess, I don't know. I mean, I guess I, I'll be honest, my, my take on it is I don't know what the effect size is of lockdown. I, I certainly don't. I mean, I think we'll get a lot of papers in the next decade that try to probe it. Uh, to me, I think it's conceivably possible that under some circumstances it has some effect size. Um, obviously the lockdown that we did in the US, in a lot of ways, it was a silly intervention. For instance, um, we were strictest about it in the whole nation in a short period of time, even though some places in the nation had no problem at all. Um, and we were quite strict about it there. And then they eventually uh, fatigued and went back to doing certain behaviors. And the moment they fatigued, you know, they eventually got, you know, the, the caseload there. Um, and, and the degree to which we did it obviously was, you know, as much as we could do it in this country, which is, you know, not welding doors shut. Um, so I guess, I mean, I, I have a lot of, I have a lot of uh, uncertainty. I, I guess I don't know the answers. I mean, it's not that lockdown doesn't have an effect yes, on the yes. on the disease I and the see. spread. Yes, because it does. It does. Okay. Uh, so, for example, in the U.S., we locked down the uh, the laptop class, the people, the professionals, yes. the the lawyers, the bankers, the journalists, the scientists, and yes. so on, yeah. who can work from home, uh, uh, and who can then receive food from. Uh, delivered from the grocery stores or the Uber drivers will take it from the restaurants. But those, uh, the working class, the workers, they still have to work because we have to eat and uh, we have to have electricity to our, uh, to our homes uh, and so on and so on. So it's impossible to lock down everybody 100% okay. unless maybe for a day or two, but you cannot do that. So you have to have uh, society operating. Otherwise we will starve to death. Yeah. Okay. So what happened was in the US, we did a lockdown that benefited the professional class. Yes. And we can see that, for example, there's data from Toronto, but also other places that yes. the, the, the wealthy neighborhood of, in Toronto in, in the spring and the same is, is true now in the second way, but uh, in the wealth in, in the beginning, it, it was sort of increasing about the same. And then when I did the lockdown, it sort of flattened out in the wealthy neighborhoods, but in the, uh, the less affluent neighborhoods, it has uh, spiked. Uh, yes. And then eventually, of course, it came down because there were more immunity. Yes. So, uh, so it is possible to sort of protect a certain group of society by having them uh, locking down. Uh, but it's not, possible. It, yeah. it's not possible to do it for the whole population because we have to have... Uh, 
uh, food and so on. We have to have a society have to operate. Uh, so what we did with the lockdown, we put the burden on the, the less affluent, on the working class, and especially on the inner city working working people. Yeah, and um, I think I, I think the data that you're citing is data I've seen Steph Burrell present. Um, I think he presented it in that BMJ forum, uh, which shows rather convincingly that lockdowns um, uh, kept virus. Uh, out of rich neighborhoods and, and unfortunately didn't keep it out of people who had to do uh, essential work or had to or who need a paycheck to, to make it to the next paycheck. Um, but I wonder if you might, um, uh, and, and, I, and I think Steph has put it this way rather nicely, which is that, um, you know, if one were to stand back and look at the things we did in the United States, one would see a set of interventions um, that is primarily concerned with protecting wealthy people, um, that we're more concerned about uh, mask mandates when you run outside than we are with providing paid sick leave to people who work in a kitchen. So if they have fevers, uh, that they, they could potentially get paid and not have to go in. Uh, you know, all these sorts of just discriminatory um, and, and, and classist kind of interventions. Yeah, that's one thing actually that Sweden did right, because uh, uh, very early during the pandemic, they changed it. So it used to be that you only got sick leave after the second or third day of being sick. And that was sort of to so that people won't abuse the system. Yes. But when the pandemic came, they did very quickly change it so that you got uh, pay even from the very first day. And I think that was a, a very smart move to do because that, and then of course, I encourage people, if you have a cold or a fever or whatever, or, or, or a cough, uh, you should stay home. Uh, okay, so nice. that's one thing that, that's sort of one, and, and uh, that's one way, uh, and of course, that's especially important uh, in places where a lot of older people work uh, or where a lot of older people are like nursing homes. But it's sort of a thing that we should do generally in a situation like this. I agree with you. I mean, I think that, um, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't think, I, I, I just can't see anyone dispute the claims that uh, we would have done a lot better off had we um, provided resources to protect very vulnerable people, particularly people in nursing homes, which still account for uh, a tremendous amount and a disproportionate amount of casualties in this country. I think the people who disagree with you, the place they'll disagree with you about is whether or not, um, and to what degree we could have had society functioning normally. I think that's the point of disagreement. But the point of agreement that, you know, that I think that is getting lost in the heat of the moment is that everybody, I think, should feel strongly that you can protect the vulnerable people. Let me ask you this, Martin, because I'm going to get to Great Barrington Declaration and talk about you know the culture of science. Um, I guess, and I forgive me for asking; it's an impudent question, but I guess my question is: uh, Are you an extreme right-wing libertarian or not? I mean, I'm not, I'm not even saying that. Not that that is a wrong thing to be. I think there are, in fact, uh, good people who are identify as libertarians. I I personally don't identify as a progressive political left, close to Elizabeth Warren. But I'm curious about your own. Uh, because you've been, uh, it's it's um, it's always something that people hang around your neck, and I get the feeling that it's not true. But I'm just curious, uh, where do you fall on the political spectrum? Are you on the hard? Are you on the right? Are you a libertarian? So, uh, uh, in uh, so the Swedish government, uh, in I think did the right thing in the spring, not only uh, with the sick leave, but also, for example, by keeping all schools open yes. and daycare from age one to fifteen. <clears throat> So I very much supported keeping the schools open and never closing the schools. Now Sweden has a socialist government. Uh, I also support the uh, focus protection study that DeSantis have done in Florida and he's of course a Republican. So I guess the answer to your question is that in Sweden, I'm a left-wing fanatic, left fanatic socialist and in Sweden, I, I'm a, a, a right-winger. I see. Uh, uh, but uh, in a way, I think, I guess in, uh, that's just the COVID. But I think in a way, I think the, the, the question is a little bit dangerous. Yes, okay. Because uh, as a public health scientist, it's, it's important to communicate with everybody. Yes, I agree. And I care, to, I, I care for the life of everybody, uh, whether they are socialists or uh, right-wing uh, libertarians or right-wing libertarians or left-wing libertarians or whatever. Uh, I care about uh, the lives of everybody and the health of everybody. And if you want to communicate the message in a crisis like this, I think it's not wise of public health scientists to mix their public yes, health I, messages I, with I, their political views. Yes, I agree. So if I would write tweets 
and half of them are about the pandemic and half of them are my political beliefs, whether they are to the left or the right, uh, I'm gonna basically uh, turn off half the population. Yeah, I and I don't think that's the right approach to public health. So of course, anybody is, is, should be welcome and encouraged to uh, express what their political beliefs are. But I don't think in my case, my political beliefs are not very uh, very useful for others to know. I see. But I do think I know something about public uh, public health. So that's the message I want to get out. So for the time being, I'm sort of putting my political uh, views aside. And uh, if you go back to my history and that, you can find out what they are. Okay. Uh, if I you're an investigative I... journalist, but uh, <laughs> for the time being, I, I but... want to sort of put those aside. Yeah and focus on the public health issues. Okay. And also yeah. I, I, uh, I have that as a principle to, uh, to talk to any media versus left or right. Yes. And I have done so. In trouble. Uh, I have written for Wall Street Journal who is on the right. I also had an interview with uh, Jacobin Magazine which is one of the most left-wing uh, socialist yeah. magazines in the US. Yes. And same in Sweden, both the left and the right and so on. So I think uh, I don't, uh, I don't decline to uh, communicate with the media just because of their political views, because I think the public health message has to go out no matter what. I agree with you. I mean, and, and you're preaching to the choir because I don't know if you know, I've, I've written about this a few times, which is that I think that in, in um, many people may be tempted to turn their Twitter feed into a mix of masks work, hydroxychloroquine is unproven, uh, vote for Joe Biden. The more you do that, the more you specifically endorse specific candidates, you, you become a partisan figure even unbeknownst to yourself and you ultimately erode your credibility i think with a large swath of people who may otherwise see the wisdom of what you say but identify you too much with that label but let me put it let me ask you the question a different way because i mean i guess i'm not so interested in your political beliefs if i'm perfectly honest i'm interested in one question which is if um if somebody said in march of 2020 to you martin um we want to pass a federal bill and the federal bill will provide $200 billion of funding for one purpose and one purpose only, which is if somebody is impoverished um, and they come down with a fever and they feel sick, they can dial this hotline. And with this $200 billion, we're going to use the federal money. They dial this hotline. The hotline says, look, we got you covered. Um, I, know you don't have a, I, don't ha I know you don't have a lot of money. I know you're trying, to, you're, you're trying to make ends meet paycheck to paycheck. What we're going to do for you, and you have a fever, we're going we're gonna to make sure you're whole. We're gonna pay your paycheck too. We're gonna to have you come out here if you're with the family. You got you got seven people in your household. We're gonna let you, we're gonna find a hotel for you in the area. We're gonna bring your meals to you. We're gonna make it easy for you. We're gonna give you a, a little bit of a, a check, and we're gonna keep a close eye on your loved ones. And and we promise we're not gonna we're not gonna involve immigration if there are any immigration issues. We're not gonna we're not gonna make your life difficult. We're gonna make your life easy. If somebody said we're going to take $200 billion in federal funds and pay for this service, a real public health service, would you be opposed to that service or would be, you be a supporter of that service in March 2020? Uh, I think uh, having paid leave for people who were sick uh, was a very important thing that Sweden did. And I think yes. it would have been important to do in, in the U.S., uh, whether the federal government should do it or the state should do it, that's sort of a political rather than a okay. public health issue. But I think uh, also as part of the Great Barrington Declaration, one thing we have is there is that uh, uh, to protect older people in multi-generational homes, which are often uh, in less affluent families, it's important to do that so that uh, to sort of uh, during the height of a pandemic that they can be isolated. And sometimes they maybe can move to a, a brother or a sister and sort of isolate together. Uh, which it would, might be the best way to do it. But if that's not possible, we think we mentioned that uh, uh, making some of those empty hotel rooms available for that, for all the people who had to, for a short period of time, separate from, uh, from, their, uh, uh, from the children that they were living in with a multi-generational home, that would be a very good uh, strategy. So, so in other words, I got you down on record as saying, that you support the use of government funds to pay for services such as the ones described? Well, uh, well I think in a, in a pandemic, the, the government has to spend money. Okay, to, there you go. There you go, Martin. Are, uh, there you go, Martin. You're, uh, you've answered my question. I mean, I, I think I'm satisfied with your answer. 
because I think that that is something your critics uh, have unfairly foisted upon you, that you, for some degree, they, I mean, I think that they would allege you do not believe the government should spend money on resources. But the fact is, you do believe that the government ought to spend. I'm just trying to clarify in my own mind. I, I mean, my, 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 I think my, my belief is, yes, that it's, it, absolutely, they ought to do it. Um, and I'm hearing from you that, you know, you believe that's reasonable and part of a public health strategy. And I mean, uh, the, the government should, should uh, keep the schools open and that's uh, customary. Course, that's, yeah. And, but also uh, uh, protecting the old is not only about the uh, nursing homes. So for example, uh, in schools, the children uh, are not at high risk because for them, COVID is less dangerous than, uh, uh, than the annual influenza. Not that they can't be infected, but in terms of mortality. Uh, children do not die very much in influenza, but the risk is even smaller for COVID. Yeah. And in Sweden, they kept the schools open, the 1.8 million children ages yeah. 1 to 15, there were actually zero deaths during the spring, during the height of the pandemic. Yeah. And like quoting the New England Journal of Medicine letter, yeah. Sweden didn't even use uh, any masks in schools, no yeah. social distancing, and, uh, uh, and they didn't do any testing. Yeah. And the, the teachers were less risk than, than others. But for teachers above age 60, they are a little bit of increased risk, yeah. not as high as the 70s. Yeah. So it's very reasonable, I think, that to arrange so that the older teachers can stay home and not work, provide in-person teaching. Yes. But that's no reason to close the schools, but you should sort of use the resources that you have in the schools to make sure that those older teachers do not have to work in person. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, no, I mean, I think... Um... Yeah, I mean, the one thing I wanted to pin down was that um, this issue of resources, I think it's an important issue. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the schools. I think you're right. Um, I think, uh, uh, I mean, the, the letter you're quoting, this isn't this a Ludvigsen? Who's, what's his name? Well, there's actually two things because the Public Health Agency of Sweden uh, published a report in, I think it was early July, okay. where the data was very clear that there was no childhood death, only a few hospitalizations, and that... Uh, uh, and that the teachers were no higher risk than the average other profession. Yeah. What Jonas Ludwigsson did uh, was mm -hmm. to sort of formalize that, um, publish it in New England Journal of Medicine, um, doing certain adjustments like for age and stuff like that. Right. So it was a more of a solid scientific uh, uh, analysis. The, the early data from the public health authority in Sweden were more raw numbers, but they were still very clear uh, because zero death is zero death, huh? uh, whatever adjustments you do. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, and that's something that people point out about the vaccines, that if you get the vaccine, there's been uh, uh, a nearly no uh, hospitalizations or deaths from SARS-CoV-2. But I mean, just, to, just, to, just to, to point out on this letter, this is a letter of 1.75 million kids in Sweden between March and June of 2020. They attended school. There was no distancing. There was no masks. And I think what it shows clearly is there are 15 cases of people with severe multi-inflammatory syndrome in kids um, uh, requiring hospitalization out of 1.95 million, which is roughly one in 130,000, which is low. There were zero deaths. And in terms of teachers, I think there's, there's a new paper out on Ember, and it looks a pooled analysis of teachers who worked in person in many settings. And it um, takes the risk of, of COVID spread in schools and contrasts it with out of schools. And what they find is that for teachers and students, you're 20 times more likely to get COVID outside of school than in school if you were to attend in-person school, 20 times difference, and that the risk to the teacher of dying of SARS-CoV-2 from acquiring it in a school for the average age teacher, which you allude to, is roughly the risk of driving five miles in a car. And for an elderly teacher, it's about 16 miles in a car, which is not a zero risk, but is a risk that we always accept. Um, but I agree with you wholeheartedly that, um, I mean, no, I mean, uh, but the closure of public schools, uh, uh, I guess I would say, if, if when they closed in March, I was okay with it because there was a lot of uncertainty. When they failed to reopen by uh, the fall, I think that was when uh, we had reached a, a crisis proportion. And when they failed to open in October, November, December, January, February, when they continue to fail to open today, I think there's no excuse for that. That is a calamity, and it will go down as the greatest error in uh, policy um, perhaps uh, for a generation. I agree with that. It's tragic. It's tragic. And, and I think one of the things that's difficult to articulate is that um, um, 
when one makes public health policy, one must naturally value life and life is precious and every life is worth, I heard you say that in the beginning of this podcast, um, mental health is precious too. Um, feelings of anxiety and depression uh, ought not exist. Um, the well-being and upward mobility of the children uh, who will someday inherit this planet, uh, that's precious too. Um, we must balance all these different things. And they're not all the same coin. They're different coins sometimes. Um, but, but public health expertise and policy naturally values different coins. And, and I will say, Martin, I believe there's a huge disconnect between social media and what actual people think. I walk around the hospital and my office is on the ID, infectious disease floor of, of physicians. And I will say that many of them are deeply concerned with prolonged school closures. Many of them are concerned with the, um, uh, that lockdowns perpetuate inequality. Many of them are not the kind of people who wanna go on Twitter and tweet their opinion because that puts them in the crosshairs and they don't wanna put themselves out there. So they are quiet. Um, and when they see me coming, they laugh at me because they see I've been lambasted on Twitter, but I don't get it as hard as you do, Martin. <laughs> Not as hard as you do. But um, so I wonder if you might just for a minute talk about the fact that when you approach a public health question, it seems to me you're, you're weighing all of these different things to some degree. Is that fair? Yeah, so that's, one of, uh, that's what I've mentioned that uh, we have thrown out the window uh, many of the basic principles of public health. And one is that uh, if you're a physician, you have to treat your patient and maybe they have stomach cancer and you treat them for stomach cancer. You're focused on stomach cancer and that's the way you should be. But in public health, we have to uh, look at all uh, health outcomes. We can't just focus on uh, one disease on COVID. We have to look at all physical health and also mental health. Mm -hmm. So that's the basic principle of public health that you can't do something that might help for one disease and then it makes it 10 times worse for another. And we have never had that proper discussion. And uh, uh, I've been helping a little bit uh, setting up a, a sort of a, a, a web page called Collateral Global uh, that collects uh, uh, the various studies about the, the enormous uh, collateral damage that we have seen to public health, both phys uh, physical health and mental health. Another principle of public health is that you can't just look at the short term. If you go back into, into last year, you see all these studies, which country did better than the other, but it was just uh, up to a certain point. And you have to look at it over many, many years. That's sort of like judging a marathon run, uh, like who is leading after, after one and a half mile. Yes, exactly. Uh, I, I could yeah. probably uh, beat a lot of uh, good runners being ahead of one and a half miles, but by the end of it, I'm gonna be far, far behind. Yeah. So you have to look at the long term yeah. and both in terms of COVID. Uh, so there's no point in just pushing things in the, into the future because that can just make things worse yeah. because it's harder for the older people to protect themselves for a longer time, but also with, uh, with other diseases. So for example, we know that uh, cancers have dropped in 2020. We have less cancer diagnosed and less cancer treatment being started. And that's not because people don't have cancer. Uh, uh, so it's just because we don't detect it. And if we don't uh, uh, treat them earlier, we will have uh, worse outcomes than somebody who might have lived 10 years might now die three or four years from now. Yeah. So those are, those are tragic consequences. The other, the other principle is public health is about everybody. The rich and, uh, rich. and what we have done with the lockdowns, we have shifted the burden of this pandemic uh, from the affluent mm -hmm. uh, to those that are less affluent, right. uh, both within the country of the United States, but also in the world, because because of the lockdowns, there have been uh, uh, thousands of children who have starved to death in the developing world. Uh, things has come backwards with tuberculosis and other disease preventions. So uh, that's another basic principle of public health. Another principle, of course, is that we cannot uh, close down scientific discussions. We have to have an open discussion and open discourse Not anymore, about Martin. the science. Not anymore. So that's that's uh, one thing that you have been uh, been uh, a great advocate for, and uh, you have taken a lot of heat for it. So uh, for for sort of defending uh, scientific discourse. So maybe we also need a group of people who can defend the defenders mm -hmm. of scientific discourse.
I guess that, that's what we have like 10 minutes left. That's what I want to talk to you about. Um, I want to come to your recent tweet that's been censored, but um, I guess um, what, what do I want to say? I guess I, I guess it baffles me that even people who disagree with you do not see, do not see that having a culture where you cannot let Martin even talk when you have to label Martin's tweets, when you have to say that Martin, I mean, people, I mean, I, literally people say, have said that you are somehow pro death. And I guess I, I don't get the feeling from talking with you or from reading your work that you actually wish ill upon people. I don't, I do not, I will, I'm going to be on the record to say, I'll put myself out there. Martin Kulsdorf does not want bad things to happen to people. You do not, that's not one of your goals. Martin may have a different way he believes public health should be. I mean, I'm, I'm sympathetic to a lot of what you say. Um, and, 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 but you know, you and I may not agree hundred percent. That's okay. You know, we can still be friends. Of course, you know, we don't have to agree on everything. Um, but Martin does have a valuable perspective. And so what, I guess what fascinates me is similarly people on the other side. I mean, there are some noted advocates of uh, COVID zero and prolonged lockdown. Uh, as much as I disagree with them, I feel that their view may be couched in some naivete, that they may believe that we are more powerful than we really are, that they don't understand that policy is not just this thing you model on a computer, it's this thing you implement in the real world and people cheat and people have other needs and you can't blame them for that. And I don't believe shame is useful. You know, as I, but I never once think to myself that they are bad people motivated by wanting bad things to happen. I think you know, there, there, there are ways we disagree. Um, to me, what, 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 what is an existential crisis would be if we reach a point where science and politics become indistinguishable and um, we, we, we quiet down and, and flag and, and de-throttle, which means showing it in fewer posts, views and opinions we dislike. And I'll just, give, I'll just talk very briefly about your recent tweet. Um, your recent tweet was something to the effect of, um, you know, that, uh, and I don't even know if I'll fully agree with you, but I think I may see a lot of wisdom in what you say. But, you know, the vaccine I think is terrific, particularly for older people. If I were in charge of vaccine distribution, I'd give it to older people first, and then let's work our way down a little bit. Um, right now we're talking about giving it to people in this country, United States adolescents between 12 and 15. Um, you know, whether or not you want to do that in the future, uh, that's an open question, I think, but I would certainly vaccinate everyone over the age of 70 globally before I get to 12 year olds in the U S and I believe it, it is an unjust world. If you'll vaccinate a 12 year old in this country before you'll vaccinate a 74 year old in India, I think you must look yourself in the, look in the mirror and ask what kind of world are you participating in? That is a world of hegemony and cruelty because that 12 year old does not have the risk of death of that 74 year old in India. Okay, so your tweet, I think, was something on the order of um, we ought to vaccinate elderly people, but one must, uh, but, but um, whether or not every child requires vaccination is an open question or something like that. Is that fair to say what your tweet was? Yeah, approximately, yeah. Uh, I think that vaccines are very important for older people. Yeah. Um, uh, that's part of focus protection. And I yeah. agree with you that uh, uh, I, I feel a little bit... Uh, Unease when I see young uh, politicians or young students uh, bragging on Twitter that they got the vaccine, <laughs> while I know that uh, uh, I, I know people who are 86 years old and uh, uh, a lady who hasn't gotten it yet, and there are others. And of course, in the developing world, there are many people, all the people who haven't got it because they don't have the same, uh, they haven't received that many doses. And for example, this vaccine passport, I think that's uh, a terrible yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, public health things that are good for two reasons. One is through coercion, you're actually making people uh, not trust the vaccine and not just the COVID vaccine, but also other uh, vaccines. So for decades, uh, we have tried to build up the trust in vaccines. Right. And I think we've been succeeded, su successful because the group who, who don't are, are very small. But, but the people who are now pushing uh, the vaccine passports, they are much more dangerous to vaccinations than uh, uh, any uh, anti-vax groups have ever been. But let, I mean, okay, One I'll example that in is a second, in the but... third world, because if we, with, if we impose vaccine passport in the US or Europe, then the people from South America <laughs> exactly. or Africa or Asia, those who want to travel, who are wealthy and young, they're going to snag those vaccines yeah, before right, right. the the poor old lady in the favelas who is 75 who really needs it. Yes. Uh, so, okay. Uh, I want to, I, I guess I only got five minutes with you. I guess I want to make this point. Um, uh, 
uh, that I mean, I, I'm very sympathetic to you on the vaccine passports. I, I worry a lot of the ways it can it can worsen inequities and inequalities. I hadn't thought so much about whether or not uh, banding about about it might affect vaccine hesitancy. I'll think more about that. But the point I want to make to you is this, that I think reasonable people may disagree. There might be somebody who thinks that, yeah, you ought to vaccinate kids. I've seen op-eds about that topic. Martin points out that we have to first prioritize the elderly. I think that's another reasonable point of view. I mean, I, I don't even want to say who's right or who's wrong. I have my own feelings. Uh, but, but the point I want to make is what, what should the social media environment look like? And what happened is your tweet, a lot of people, first I'll say they dunked on your tweet. So a lot of people who dislike you for, I think, your general stance or for having signed this declaration, and they've been beating up on you all this time. They dislike your tweet. And many of them pointed out this is stupid. And then they quote tweeted and they screenshot it, and they say Martin is a shitty person and all the things they like to say about you. Okay. Yawn, I'm tired of that. I mean, I'm tired of this kind of childish behavior, but okay, fine. They say what they say. But then Twitter, the platform, puts a stamp on your tweet and the tweet says, exclamation mark, the same thing that Donald Trump got, you know, that this is misleading and you're not allowed to like it. It's going to be dethrottled. You're not the only person this has happened to. Um, Marty Macri had a Facebook, had a Wall Street Journal op ed about, you know, Marty thinks April 30th will be the day that we have herd immunity in the US. That's Marty's view. It's an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. You can agree or disagree, but Facebook has labeled that misinformation. They've dethrottled it. Dethrottling, it means like people say, oh, it's not censorship. You know, you can still read it. But dethrottling is a type of heavy handedness. It literally sure. suppresses this content from being in the eyes of people, even when their social network says that we like this content, we appreciate it, which is contrary to the normal way the platform works. Okay, so I don't want to quibble about it, but I think it is a type of censoring. I, I, will, I will say that. Um, but what I will say, what I will say is that um, we need to have an honest conversation, which is that even if you think Martin is incorrect about it, uh, ought we use the brute force of the platform to uh, uh, suppress that idea when we acknowledge there is uncertainty around that situation? Um, and also when we um, recognize that we need to have a forum for dialogue and the threshold to, I believe, censor a Harvard professor who has worked in this space his whole career, it's got to be really high. There has to be a process. It has to be transparent. There has to be an appeals process. And unless you put all those things in place, I'm deeply troubled. And the last thing I'll say before I let you have the final word, the last thing I'd say is I investigated how Facebook censors and I looked through their, their censoring. They're picking people who are on Twitter disproportionately proportionately. They're like overwhelmingly on Twitter. And these are people who are known to disagree with you. Like I know, I know I have a sense of how you might view some things. I have a sense of how other people might view some things. And there are fundamental disagreements. And so if I pick people who disagree with you to be your um, uh, peer reviewer, they're going to, they're going to stomp it out. And if I pick maybe you to dis you know, you might stomp out their thing, but maybe you believe in freedom of speech. Okay. Last thought. Um, what are your thoughts on this, this climate of how we label things and stuff? Yeah. Uh, I agree with you, uh, uh, except for the, the few words that you used. I started with F. I wouldn't have used those. <laughs> I don't know that. I agree with you. It's my show. I can use it. I can use it. Yeah. Uh, and the article you wrote about uh, uh, the Facebook, how they do the censoring, I think was fantastic, excellent. So, I mean, uh, what I would say is this, if, if, if one of your listeners, if, if, if they are a, uh, an epidemiologist, and they disagree with me about uh, uh, the COVID strategy or, or, or vaccine passport or something like that, I would be delighted to have a discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, we can have a moderated discussion uh, in public and uh, we can just sort of uh, uh, talk about it. And uh, I think that's what's needed to, uh, both to, to, to save science and make progress in, in science and, and public health, but also to ensure that the public actually trusts science, because if you start to censor science, yes. then the public is going to distrust science and that's going to spill over. It's not just about uh, this pandemic, it's going to spill over to medicine in general, to uh, other types of vaccines, uh, which would be very sad, but also to other areas of science, including environmental issues and, uh, and uh, more social issues, economics and so on. It's going, to, it's going to spill over to, to the rest of science. And if we don't, if we don't maintain the, uh, the scientific discourse, if it starts with do, we do censoring or, or slandering instead of di discussions, then I think uh, 300 years of enlightenment has come to an end. Yeah, that's and right. That would be very unfortunate, I think. Yeah. I, um, I, 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 I want to close. I mean, I, I, agree, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I wonder if you would say this. Um, if you took SARS-CoV-2 and you pulled it out 
and you dropped it in 1998 or even 2008, you wouldn't have had the same pandemic. I'll tell you why. This technology, the speed of the internet, did not, could not sustain what we're doing right now. We couldn't sustain it in 2008. We couldn't have a video dialogue like this and record. We couldn't have so many people of the white collar class work from home. Couldn't be done. You couldn't get food delivered to your house at, at a whim. You couldn't get all this takeout delivered at a whim uh, with Uber Eats and, and Amazon Prime. Um, you couldn't, uh, yeah, so all these things were different. And, and I think had the same pandemic occurred back then, we would have had focus protection, Martin. We would have had what you suggest. The technology allowed people who do not, um, who, who their own life could be, uh, uh, who they could tolerate the isolation. They didn't get laid off. Can you imagine? 1998, you did the same thing. All these people be laid off. They wouldn't be, they wouldn't be working. They would be laid off if you decided not to work. And instead of being laid off, they would say, I'm going to come in there with a mask on. We're going to sit apart. We're going to open some windows. We'll do our best to mitigate this. We're going to have older people protected. We're gonna, basically, they would have been Great Barrington Declaration signatories. Um, I mean, I, this is a hypothesis. I don't know this to be true, but I offer it for dialogue. I offer this hypothesis because I'm curious if you think there's some truth in this, that the technology actually chained us to this response. It didn't liberate us. I mean, it, it led to this response because the technology allowed people it, with means to protect themselves disproportionately from the virus, even while they instituted things that didn't protect the, the least fortunate. I think that are very interesting thoughts. Uh, uh, I hadn't thought about that, but I think you might be, uh, you, you, you might have found the truth there uh, to a lot of explanation of what is going on. It might not be the only thing that's that's uh, uh, affecting it, but uh, that might be a big part of the picture. I'll tell you another thing that's affecting it. The same flu that hit in 57, 58, the people were different than the people today. This is another hypothesis I have. You know, I think about my parents' generation. I think about my grandparents' generation. Those were different people. The way they viewed the world was different. The way they viewed the world, uh, they, they viewed, the, way they, the way they viewed health, and what it means to live a good life and the way they viewed risk and probability of risk and risk of death was fundamentally different. And those people, people who had tasted war and depression, um, they were very cognizant that, uh, that the youth is something that's very important. They were very cognizant that to some degree, uh, life must go on to some degree. And I think that those same people, if you drop them in 2020, they would have been very critical of num a number of the measures we had. So, and I think our society is different. I mean, this is a society where I walk by the, the park and I see adults, <laughs> not even just not a joke, I see adults, they stand on the top of the slide to make sure their, their kid doesn't fall off the slide when they go up to the top. Uh, that's a different culture. Uh, that's a culture that didn't exist when I was a kid. That's a culture of safetyism. It's a culture of, the safetyism does not mean that you care about safety. It cares about safety, you can see, you can count, you discount safety, you cannot see, you cannot count, that's in the future. It's a certain type of cognitive uh, belief or potentially bias. Um, that's also a factor here. If it were the people from 1957, you dropped them here, they would behave differently. Thoughts? Yeah, and another one thing that is different is how we deal with infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. because <clears throat> now we have vaccines for so many things so we're sort of not used to having to deal with infectious diseases but 50 years ago we did uh, because at that time we didn't there were only a few things we had in, uh, vaccines for so for example when i was a child my parents told me to go uh, and play with this friend of mine who had mumps because mm -hmm. they wanted to make sure i got mumps before I got into puberty because that's what is more dangerous. Yes. So, so the whole way that people were thinking of infectious diseases, I think, uh, was different uh, 50 years from uh, 50 years ago from the way it is now. That's interesting. I, uh, I think um, in my own life was the advent of ver uh, chickenpox vaccine varicella, and prior to that, uh, yeah, I remember the 1980s. A lot of parents would push the kids to you know get it over with, get it early, and 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 deal with chickenpox. Um, yeah, and especially mumps and rubella, because of those course. are the ones that have Fertility. severe consequences if you get it later right. in life. Uh, yes. Mumps for boys and uh, rubella for girls. Yes. Um, it's been interesting. I mean, I guess I would say the last thing I'd say about the state of the academy is it's also, it's the digital, it's the digital world, Martin. I mean, if people had to look you in the eye and say some of the things they say on Twitter, they, you know, they would never say it. Um, because you know you're not a bad person, you're a good person, and you've been working in this space a long time. And I think that that that's that's very problematic. 
and I guess I don't know. I'm I'm I, I I'm going to go back and delete my little outburst before I post this video, so there'll be no record of it. <laughs> so I'm going to remove those two words that I was saying. But I guess I would put it to you this way. I guess it really troubles me that people do not see what is going on in the sense that they are, um, they're fueling the tribalism that they see as a problem, that their extremism, that their uh, inability to talk to you, to see where you disagree, where you disagree, that that itself fuels the, 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 the pole that they are fighting is to some degree fueled by their own behavior. Um, and that, you know, I, I, I really worry. I mean, Martin, I mean, let me, I, I mean, I sometimes think that God forbid there's some future catastrophe. There's a piece of uh, astronomic debris hurtling to earth. Uh, okay, just like the movies, right? And we have to all decide, well, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna try to divert the debris? Are we gonna blow up the debris? I was like, you, you don't even need to get into that. The society will tear itself apart. Uh, the academy uh, will abdicate their role to even di have dialogue about what to do. It will become the Republican position will be to blow it up and the Dems will say to divert it. You know, It'll become political. I was like, how the hell did that, that ad, the astronomic debris became political? Um, and that's what I worry, that we are, we are the weakest we've ever been for, for any challenge that faces science and policy. Your thoughts? Uh, I think that tribalism is a problem. Yeah. And maybe I have a slight advantage there as an immigrant, mm -hmm. because if you're an immigrant into a country, you, uh, you're maybe not so, so uh, closely emotionally attached to one group versus the other. And I think that might actually be a reason why the three of us who wrote the Great Barrington Declaration, we're all immigrants. Mm. Uh, me and Jay in the US and uh, Sumatra uh, in the UK. Well, that's so interesting. I think that was an accident, actually. I think that was, there's, there's, there's some explanation for that. I guess I would say that um, my bias, I mean, the child of immigrants, um, and I guess, but my bigger, my bigger bias is that I, I don't belong to any tribes. I just, I don't, I, I've never seen myself in that way. Not political tribes, not personal tribes, not identity tribes, no tribes. I mean, I have uh, lots of interests. My biggest interest is how evidence is used to reach causal conclusions and how policy is made. I'm very interested in the gap between what sounds good in theory and what works in practice. And, um, and I, 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 I don't have very strong views on, uh, on what, are, uh, you know, on, uh, um, I don't know, are there any like things we could never do or not do? I mean, and so I try to approach every question with, uh, by pursuing the data. And I will admit that, you know, in March, I didn't see, I didn't see that schools was so bad until I started reading a lot of papers in June and July um, from the economics literature, which I think they do a good job of capturing the value of schools in a society. And then I realized that school closure is going to hurt the vulnerable people, and it's going to have repercussions on society for years to come. And that's changed my view. By September, by by October, I was doing a lot of podcasts on it, um, and that's when I realized that school closure is a huge error. Yeah, and it's important to keep that open mind. And I think it's also important to uh, uh, to actually read what those who have a different views what they are saying. Yes. So when I read those who have similar views to me, it can get a little bit boring, actually, because I know what they're saying. <laughs> but uh, I do uh, put extra effort to make sure I read uh, uh, those who have opposing views, because oh, those favorite. are the ones that I really need to understand. Uh, I agree with you, Martin. My, uh, uh, my work on cancer drug policy, which is where I pick most of my battles, I always read the opposing views, and I learn so much, and it, it makes me it gives a half our research agenda is just thinking about what they said and how to kind of maneuver around it. But um, Martin Kulsdorf, Martin Kulsdorf, um, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Um, I, uh, I hope that someday, um, you know, that there will be some in-person academic seminars and um, many of the people who felt very strongly about you, um, I hope that they get a chance to talk to you. And I hope that they, you know, maybe Keep an open mind and realize that there were a lot of policies that you all would have really agreed upon if um, if they were willing to kind of hear you out. Um, so thanks for doing this. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Great pleasure.